So I'm Nick Brozovich. I'm Director of Policy at the Water for Food Institute at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about groundwater transfers and particular market mechanisms for those. Uh, some of you have heard some of what I'm going to say before. Um, I apologize if I sound like a broken record. Uh, I often like to start with this slide in my presentations. The way that we use groundwater in agriculture hasn't really changed a lot uh, in the last hundred years. Right? We pump it out of the ground, we use it to uh, buffer against the effects of uh, weather on that crop growth. However, that said, over the last few years, there has been enormous institutional innovation in our ability to measure, monitor, uh, and allocate groundwater. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about one thing. Well, I'm going to talk about water markets. Um, my perspective is a little bit different to many people in the room. Uh, what I want to think about today in particular is what it takes to get water markets going that are acceptable to the users of those markets, in particular agricultural producers, uh, and to a lesser extent, water managers. I have a very uh, short attention span. I know that many of you do too. So I'm going to give you the three key messages that I'm going to focus on today. I hope there is some learning for everybody somewhere in these. So first of all, uh, we, both academics and policymakers, use the word market very, very loosely. Uh, I'm going to argue that markets includes many, many different transaction types, uh, some of which are really not markets at all, and those markets represent different incentives and potential outcomes, and that as we move towards implementing more markets, we really need to think more about that. Uh, second of all, I'm going to argue um, that it is both possible and in many cases desirable to separate the financial and the regulatory aspects of markets, um, whether water or other environmental markets. And then third, uh, I'm going to touch on this message that um, when you look at what matters to participants, that platform neutrality and anonymity actually have value for participants. Uh, and that's something that we don't take into account often enough in market design, uh, particularly because market structures generally offer neither anonymity or neutrality, uh, whereas some smart market mechanisms can provide both. I think many of you are familiar with the basics of markets, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. When we look at water use, and groundwater in particular, here is my example, there is a basic trade-off between conserving the resource and providing financial benefits to producers. That's a, that's a basic trade-off. Right. If we want to leave more water in the aquifer, that means uh, all else equals someone has to pump less, and that pumping goes to provide profits to the farmers. So there's a basic trade-off there. If you have a regulated system, markets can be a very, very cost-effective tool to reach those regulatory constraints. Uh, very often in the debate on markets, people forget about the regulatory system that's needed to allow a market to function well. Again, I need to emphasize this. You can't jump straight to a market. A market only exists within a set of other regulatory constraints that are enforced. We also know that markets can provide incentives for innovation. That's a pretty standard result. So groundwater markets um, and groundwater transfers, I've, I've labeled this slide Groundwater 101. A, a fairly large amount is known about surface water markets. When you start looking at the commodification of groundwater, it's important to understand that the design of those systems has some peculiarities because surface water and groundwater hydrology are different. And the reasons why you're trying to regulate the groundwater can also be different and complex. So you have complex hydrology as well as a variety of environmental and social objectives. And again, in the debate, both this morning and yesterday, we've seen some of this come out. So for example, whether you have a cap on uh, volume of pumping, number of wells, or irrigated acreage, you can commodify any of those, but the market will look different. You know, what are the characteristics of the contracts? What's the timing, duration, the accounting unit? What are the banking and carryover provisions? Uh, these things are more complex in a groundwater market than a surface water market because of the complexity of the groundwater system. Similarly, often the reason to manage groundwater uh, is because there are other concerns such as stream depletion. So surface water, groundwater interaction is a very, very 
important motivator of managing groundwater. If you care about stream depletion, a, surface, a groundwater market will, will reallocate water pumping across space and time. You have to understand how that's going to affect stream depletion. Similarly, you know, there, there might be flow zones, there might be critical area zoning to protect municipal water supply, to protect disadvantaged communities. You have to think about lagged effects if you're in a seasonal stream system uh, with seasonal habitat and so on. Overall, what this means is that within a groundwater market, there isn't one price for groundwater transfers. That's very important to understand. Unlike many surface water markets where you converge on one price, that's not the case in groundwater in general. So we can expect a lot of uh, price dispersion, idiosyncratic pricing, depending on the constraints there. Now, <clears throat> nevertheless, when you look at places where there has been uh, some partial or full commodification of groundwater and transfer schemes, we see that there is a, uh, a growing number of areas where such schemes are operating. So within the US, uh, I know about uh, these are places where groundwater trading is happening or has been attempted or is being attempted. And I added the, the, the dot, dot, dots at the end there because every time I present, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, um, you know, we're doing it here as well. And so if you do know of anywhere else on the list, tell me. But Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, California, and Washington, at the very least, are states that are attempting uh, groundwater trading systems. In other countries, Australia, New Zealand, China, India, Pakistan, Oman, and Chile, that's a partial list. The one thing I'd note there is that actually some of the most advanced schemes are in the what we might think of as the least developed countries, in that we are getting a technological leapfrogging with the metering technology. That's another talk that I don't have time for today. <clears throat> so my first point is that when we think of a groundwater market, uh, it's important to define what a market is and that there's a variety of structures and transaction types. So I want you to think for a moment, um, when you think of a water market, what is it that's happening? How does the transaction look? How does price discovery work? What is the flow of information between uh, buyer, seller, and regulator, and what is the regulatory context? When we look at most water markets, we find that they're really bilateral contracts, right? So you have a negotiation between a buyer and a seller where there's one individual on each side or one company on each side. So that is a coffee shop market or a brokerage are typical examples of bilateral contracts. You also have monopoly or monopsony arrangements where there's one buyer and many sellers or one seller and many buyers. Water banks and auctions are, are typically examples of this kind of arrangement. <clears throat> Most water exchanges uh, fall under the category of being a bulletin board. Right? So someone posts information that they're willing to buy or sell water, and then you can approach them, whether by phone, by fax, by email, by website, uh, and use that to negotiate your price. And then finally, you have approaches that come under uh, what I would call a smart market, which are algorithmic approaches where uh, information about bids and offers in the regulatory context and constraints are fed into a computer, which makes the best matches based on those. Uh, the most important thing I can say here is that an online market is not by definition smart. Most existing online water markets are simply bulletin boards. That's a very important distinction to make, and particularly in the Sigma debate, um, you see people saying, look, if we build an online market, that's going to be very smart and that'll work really well. Um, that's typically not the case. Most online markets are simply bulletin boards. Now, I say here my opinion. Uh, I'm a very opinionated person. As th those that know me will know. Uh, my opinion here is that many water transactions have underappreciated issues <coughs> with fairness. And what I mean by that is that depending on how your water market is structured, there will be a perceived or actual bias towards one side of the market. And that understanding that um, will lead you to understand why many water markets fail. So many water markets fail because they have an underappreciated uh, unfairness or perceived unfairness based on the structure, on informational asymmetry, uh, and on how price discovery works. So if you think about it, in a bilateral contract, there is informational asymmetry. Obviously, in a monopoly or monopsony market, such as an auction, there is informational asymmetry. The same is true of brokerage arrangements and generally of water exchanges. 
So the potential advantage of uh, algorithmic clearing is that a smart market can be structured in a way to remove those obstacles. I say can because you can also structure smart markets in other ways. Um, so I say groundwater trading lessons learned. Um, it's a short talk, so I don't have time to present a, uh, a large backstory here. Uh, I will say that in my own work, I've gone from very, very theoretical studies of water markets to the uh, boots on the ground, severing water rights and building a variety of smart markets for both groundwater and surface water. Uh, in that process, I've realized how little I knew about markets. Um, and so what I can say is what I've learned about what it takes to get markets going is really this. If you're a water manager, what you really care about is the verifiability of the trade and the permitting ease. Those are the things that keep you awake at night. If you're a farmer, what you care about is the fairness of the system and the confidentiality of your sensitive financial information. Right? So your water price is very similar to your input prices or very similar to your farm profits. It's very hard for me to ask farmers what their farm profits are or what kind of input, co input price contracts they've negotiated with their suppliers. So asking for water price data is exactly analogous to that. Messaging matters. Um, that is perhaps less true in California than in other parts of the world. Uh, for example, in Nebraska, where I do a lot of work, anything that had the word sustainable in it to start with would not fly with farmers at all. And I, I'd guess that there are probably issues here too with that messaging. Uh, and then a final point is you may not need perfect monitoring. And in particular, if you care about stream depletion as your primary management goal, you don't actually need to, uh, to meter water use. You can get away with just metering irrigated acreage with some caveats. So let's talk about confidentiality, trust, and pricing. If you think about it, a water transfer involves two entirely different elements. There is the regulatory element, which deals with accounting, regulatory constraints, and making sure that the letter of the law is met. And there is a financial element. There's a buyer and a seller, and there's an exchange of money. We typically conflate those two into one thing that we call a water trade. But there's not actually a reason for those two to be handled together. They can be separated entirely. Um, this, for me, was hard learning. I've tried to set things up the other way and failed, uh, and been told why that wasn't working by a number of farmers and managers. When we look at trading, you have financial information going between buyer, seller, and possibly other intermediaries. Distrust can occur under some of these situations. So first of all, if the regulator is a market participant themselves, there's obviously a conflict of interest there, and that creates enormous distrust. Similarly, if the market structure appears to favor one side of the market, that creates distrust, and also particular sensitivity around price discovery. Uh, finally, if sensitive financial information is reported to the regulator or into the public domain, again, that creates enormous distrust to agricultural producers in particular to the point that it can uh, stop market transactions happening. So how do you increase trust in markets? Well, the first thing is, uh, and this one is, I think, a very obvious one. Well, first, you, you use outreach and education to help producers understand how their water values vary over space and time. And actually understanding that there isn't one water value, but that these are continuous processes that are also spatially very variable, that's a key point. Second of all, you can separate the financial and the regulatory components of trading. Um, there's no reason technically why you can't do that. If it builds trust in the transaction, wonderful. Uh, third, to the extent possible, you build neutral platforms. In other words, you build platforms that are anonymous, that have confidential bidding, and that have clearing that doesn't favor one side over the other. And here again, I, I realize these things are uh, not the way that people usually think about markets. This is a, a more from the ground up approach of what it takes to get them going. But here's my opinion. The objective is to encourage transactions, right? Markets don't exist to be markets. They exist to reach stated goals. Right? Price discovery is just a milestone. It's not an outcome. And so to the extent that price discovery gets in the way of a market executing transactions, uh, that's a problem that needs to be addressed. So with that, let me summarize again. I have uh, 
three things that I've said. Well, first of all, markets have many different transaction types. Uh, every single one of those transaction types presents different incentives to buyers and sellers. And because the structure is different, the potential outcomes of that market will vary. This is particularly true in thin markets. And we should acknowledge that certainly in early stages, most groundwater markets will be thin. Second of all, uh, there is no technical reason not to separate the regulatory and the financial sides of water markets. If you do so, um, the advantage that you get is that it increases trust. And in particular, by separating the financial and the regulatory side, it increases the confidence of agricultural producers that their financial data won't come back and be used against them in the future. That's, again, something that from the academic and the policy side, we don't think enough about. If I'm a regulator and I'm collecting data on how producers have valued water, what's to stop me using that information in the future? So if you can separate financial and regulatory, keep the financial side anonymous, that is something that can help markets going. Now, again, this is a controversial one. I'm, a, I'm an academic researcher. I got into this research to try to understand water prices. In thicker markets, I think it's absolutely uh, it's wonderful to have all of that price information on the value of water available, but pragmatically, in the early stages when you're building markets and building trust, uh, in many cases, price discovery is the thing that gets in the way. And so that's my third point, that the price anonymity and even participant anonymity uh, and market platform neutrality have value for participants, both on the buying and selling side and the regulator side. It can be very useful for the regulator to say, look, this process is fair. Um, I'm not taking part in it. In particular, if the regulator wants to be buying or selling water on the market, it's very, very hard for them to also be managing that market because it's hard to convince people that you're doing it in a fair way. Uh, and so this argues to have um, a third party intermediary for markets, whether that's for-profit or non-profit. Uh, in my own experience, I've tried both the non-profit and the for-profit side of doing that. Um, my personal experience has been that farmers are happier contracting with for-profit companies than non-profit companies, because they are just about every transaction they undertake in their daily life is with for-profits. Uh, again, that's something that surprised me as a, as a university researcher. I'd be happy to talk more about that if people are interested. Um, and so when you have these criteria of price anonymity and neutrality, and you look at market structures, in general, market structures offer neither of those, but a well-structured smart market uh, that uses algorithmic clearing can provide both. So with that, I'll stop. I should acknowledge a variety of funding sources that have helped on this research over the years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. We have time for at least one question. Um, Would you expect to see uh, more price volatility um, at, as, an, as an input cost? And for um, crops like perennial crops that have a long-term demand, does that mean that their price of water is going to be higher than it would be for annual crops where they don't have that annual demand? The second question is, is, is there any transfer, any um, support of infrastructure in those water markets? And, and can it be a source of helping support infrastructure? Water is very different to most other commodities. You look at corn, the price has halved in the last few years and, and everybody has, you know, is of course concerned about that. Uh, the thickest water markets in the world right now are the Australian water markets in terms of volume and number of transactions. If you look at the volatility in those, you see uh, an order of magnitude, almost two orders of magnitude of price volatility over a month. So I'm going to argue that water markets there are different to most commodities in that price volatility and dispersion actually signify the market functioning the way it should. Again, if you think about it, if it's just rained, your soil profile is full, that water doesn't have any value. If you're two weeks without water or two months without water, well, boy, that water has a lot of value. And so because it's used as a production input at a very fine time scale, we should see a lot of variability in, in uh, prices. And, and a lot of the debate about water markets is focused on getting the price right. I think that's very uh, unhelpful because it leads people to set up markets 
with the concept of getting one price and then they fail. That's not a failure of the market, that's failure of the mechanism you've set up. Um, the second question uh, is to do with a perennial versus annual crops. Um, yeah, I mean, the values of water and perennial crops are going to be higher. I think the price dispersion there depends on if you're in a conjunctive use system or not. If you're purely in a uh, uh, groundwater fed system, then you'd expect the perennial water users, if, they're, if they don't have sufficient water to meet their needs, they'll buy out the junior users in drought years. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, in general, uh, how these markets are functioned is someone turns off a pump, someone turns on a pump for a lease, so no additional infrastructure is needed if you can deal with third-party impacts, but that's the hydrologic model. Uh, Texas has a peculiar law that you have to pump on your site and then pipe, with the exception of the Edwards Aquifer, which is a cast aquifer, and so it's highly connected. Um, I typically, infrastructure is expensive, and so I would view a market as a system to reach regulation cost effectively. When you start having to build infrastructure or public infrastructure to support the market, uh, it can work, but I, you know, again, I'm, I think that may be going against the cost effectiveness side of it.